good morning, everyone, once again. And uh, thank you very much for joining us on this Saturday morning in our very first COVID chatter series, Steering the Invisible Storm 1.0. My name is Joey, VP of InnoQ Business Unit in IDS Med Group, and I will be your host and moderator in today's session. Now, this session is specially brought to you by InnoQ and RespoCare and supported by IDS Med and IDS Med Learning Academy. As we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought much disruption globally. And while some are lucky to escape with flu-like symptoms are uh, asymptomatic, some others succumb to devastating effects of the disease. Now, on the 11th of March, 2020, a little about um, a year ago, WHO has declared the outbreak of the COVID-19 as a worldwide pandemic. And of course, unfortunately, Malaysia could not avoid this situation as well. And we had our first case reported confirmed back in the 4th of February, 2020. Though we did relatively well to control it during the first MCO, but um, sad to say today, we have over 330,000 cases reported positive and over 1,200 death cases. One of the group of people strongly affected by this will definitely be our frontliners where in December 2020, it was reported that almost 2,000 healthcare workers have tested positive for COVID-19. Ideas Med being part of the healthcare supply chain, we feel an obligation, especially during this very much unprecedented global healthcare situation, that we as an organization should create and support an educational platform for the healthcare providers, movers and players to share valuable insights and knowledge to help all of us go through this very difficult period. And hence, we have extended the invitation of our education platform. And you can see today we have members from the government, private education, universities, uh, private clinics, medical societies, and so on. And I'm glad that over actually over a thousand participants have registered for the webinar today. Um, so we, we feel that you know, we can all learn and benefit out of this platform as we feel that COVID knows no boundaries in affecting people. So we believe neither should the knowledge in tackling them. While today's series is targeted for Malaysia, we hope in the subsequent series, we will be able to include panels and participants from our neighboring countries as well. And I do hope all of you will be able to join us again then. Today, we are very privileged to have two distinguished speakers joining us live from my hometown, from Kelantan, whom I will introduce them to you shortly. And I'm also glad to inform all of you that we will also have a special session from a renowned scientist who will share with us a case study in his field of expertise. So now um, let's get kicking, shall we? During this pandemic, one of the identified methods of preventing the frontliners from getting infected is with the proper use of PPE. WHO itself has published and updated numerous guidelines on the rational use of PPE for COVID since the outbreak, with many discussion on recommendation of use, what to use, where, how, which setting, which personnel, and the different types of activities. Now, this discussion has always been um, uh, this extended in optimizing the availability of PPE and the supply chain coordination. This now brings me to our first topic of the day and do allow me to introduce you to our very first speaker. Associate Professor Dr. Siti Suraya, she graduated in 95 from USM and subsequently Associate got Professor her Dr. Siti Suraya, in she graduated in 95 from USM. She currently and serves as a senior lecturer at the School of Medical Sciences in Microbiology in and she is also the head of She currently serves as a senior lecturer at the School of Medical Sciences in Her field of specialization and is the head of infection control in clinical microbiology. Hospital Her field infection of specialization and, and research in bacteriology, in clinical microbiology uh, uh, during the COVID situation, um, uh, and has led the co bacteriology guidelines uh, um, you know, during the education the situation, um, uh, and has she has led also the done the situational planning guidelines, you know, the education is also part in of the risk management, and she has also the done the situational planning in the very university as well. She is also now, part of further the risk management team. Let me hand over the COVID-19 task force to Prof, who will share with well. us her topic today. Now, without or further PPE ado, let me hand over the screen time during the COVID-19 pandemic. Prof, who will share with us her topic today. Over to you, Prof. 
on PPE for healthcare personnel use during okay, the COVID-19 um, pandemic. Thank you very Over much, you, Joey, for a very kind introduction. First of all, of okay. course, I would like to um, thank. Thank you very much, Joey, for a very kind introduction. First of all, of course, I would like to thank. Yes, Prof, go ahead. Yes, Prof, go ahead. Uh, Prof, you may go ahead, Prof. Uh, even though I had a lot of uh, background, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, Prof, what is that ahead, Prof. background? Uh, even though I had a lot uh, of uh, yes. background, uh, we can uh, hear you loud uh, and clear, Prof. <laughs> All right, okay. What is that I, I, background? Because, uh, um, I have uh, a lot yes. of background uh, we can noise hear you just now. Clear, Prof. All right. Oh, okay. okay. Sorry. Thank I, you very I, much. Sorry. Uh, I, I start. I have, again. Okay. Thank uh, you very much. Very kind introduction just now. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry, so, uh, I, thank you very much. Sorry. I start again. Okay. Thank you very much, Joey, for a very kind introduction just now. I the SMAT learning and also Respos Care for organizing this SM learning today. IDS Med Learning All right. and um, also for the next Care minutes, for organizing um, this um, be seminar today. About, uh, PPE. All right, uh, um, for the next 30 minutes, um, worker during I'll be talking COVID about COVID-19 uh, pandemic. PPE. Uh, excuse yeah, me, Joey, I have a lot of, um, lot of uh, sounds like COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic. You know, uh, excuse me, Joey, I uh, have a lot of um, uh, sounds like, like um, here there also, uh, you know. Uh, at the background, no, um, do, 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 I all, all, all the people here that also? Very clearly. Oh, okay. Because uh, I have a lot of no, um, something like uh, people is coughing. We can hear you very clearly. Yeah, and then oh, okay. <laughs> because I have a lot of something so like people is coughing. Yeah, and so then for the next thirty <laughs> minutes, I'll be talking about the. So uh, I just continue, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Healthcare yeah. worker during the. So for the next thirty minutes, I'll be talking about the personal protective equipment for healthcare workers. So this is the outline of my. Um, presentation of uh, first few slides. Like I'll be talking um, about so the this mode of transmission the outline of, of my um, presentation. The of first few um, slides I'll be talking about the mode of transmission of yeah, COVID-19 and, COVID and, and then I'll be um, talking um, um, basic principle of the on the face mask yeah, and various COVID-19 forms of face and then I'll be talking a little bit on the face mask and various forms of face discussion about the available in the PPE guidelines. And then finally only we'll go um, the, uh, and to discuss uh, of course, about the this is the guideline for the guidelines for the health care but, worker, um, yeah? having said that um, this is actually and, uh, uh, of course uh, this is the guideline that we adopt and adapt from CDC WHO and KKM so this is actually a standard guideline that can be used for every uh, everybody can use this guideline yeah all right next slide uh, okay um, this slide just discuss, just to re recap back, uh, I think all of us are very well versed already about the COVID-19 transmission. Start from the first case of COVID-19 um, uh, way back in early 2020 or before that already, WHO clearly made a statement that COVID-19 is transmitted to through droplet. So when we say droplet transmission, we are actually referring into two things. Yeah, One is the size of the infectious particle, yeah, which is um, uh, more than five micron. We are talking about more than five micron size. And also the, 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 this, the distance of the, the distance of the source and uh, to the, uh, the, the susceptible host is within one meter. So droplets is actually referring to that condition. Yeah. So having said that, yeah, uh, having said that, um, droplets is always associated with contact transmission also, because you see when the patient cough or when the patient sneeze, the patient cannot avoid touching their uh, body fluids. Yeah? Automatically, they will touch their body fluid and subsequently they will touch the areas surrounding them, what we call highly touchable areas, including, for example, the door knobs or, or the surfaces. So 
uh, automatically they, whether they are realizing or not there will be contact transmission occur uh, when uh, they uh, when they sneeze or cough so these two contact transmission and droplet trans transmissions is very um, uh, uh, well known related to covid-19 uh, disease yeah this knowledge is very important because we are you, you are going to utilize this knowledge when we want to uh, 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 use our PPE later. Yeah? And on top of these two mode of transmission, it can also convert into airborne transmission. So airborne, when we talk about airborne, we are actually um, we are actually uh, talking about smaller size, eh? less than five micron, and the distance from the source, the infective source, to the um, to the uh, susceptible host. Yeah, the the the, the length of the the, uh, the 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 distance can be more than one meter. No more one meter, but it can be uh, longer than that. Yeah, so these three droplets, contact, and airborne are related to COVID-19 transmission. Okay, next slides. Okay, these slides basically discuss about hierarchy of control of any infectious disease. Yeah. So if you as you can see from these slides, yeah, first um, the most important and most effective way to control the infectious disease are, is one, of course, the, the most effective one is eliminations of the source and substitution. But obviously in um, our case, yeah, we cannot eliminate and we cannot substitute COVID-19 with other things. Yeah? We, have to, we have to accept that. Yeah? So we just live with the engineering control, administration, administrative control, and last but least effective one, PPE. Yeah. For engineering control, it means that, for example, for example, uh, uh, the, the the we have to have a, a specific areas, yeah, for patient management with the good ventilation, for example, or the best, of course, would be the areas or uh, the room that with a negative pressure that would be the best, yeah, um, setting for management of patient with COVID nineteen, and uh, uh, on following that we should have a good administrative control, administrative control which mean uh, which include standard operating procedures, yeah, um, uh, a good training for the staff on, for example, wearing um, donning and doffing, uh, all those uh, important things should be cater here. And finally, but the least uh, effective um, uh, mode of, uh, you know, uh, control of infectious disease, wearing PPE. So uh, at the end, uh, PPE is the last resort that the, the healthcare worker can use to protect themselves from getting the infection. So next slide. Okay, thank you. So this one is actually to share um, the standard precaution actually standard precaution is some something that already we applied before before covid-19 so maybe uh, there, there are 10 elements of standard precaution but maybe related to the current pandemic maybe number 1 hand hygiene yeah and then of course uh, number 2 ppe when needed of course uh, uh, this is the one that we are going to share and then environmental control, environmental cleaning. Yeah, as I mentioned just now, we cannot run away from contact transmission. So, environmental control is very, very, very important. So that we have to make sure all the contaminated areas. Yeah, by you know subsequent, uh, you know after after patient have contact with the, for example surfaces, yeah, door knobs, all those things need to be clean um, adequately and frequently so that we can break the chain of transmission. And last but not least is the number 10, yeah, uh, the, uh, the cough, cough, etic, cough etiquette. Yeah? So this is actually uh, that something that should be uh, with us already for, for um, before, even before COVID come. Yeah? All right. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this is actually uh, just to share with you the hand hygiene. I'm from infection control. Infection control people cannot run away from, you know, talking about hand hygiene. Hand, hand hygiene, it should be done adequately and with the proper step. I believe in many hospitals, in every hospital, this photo 
Uh, uh, this photo is available everywhere. So very important, um, very important uh, to follow the steps, yeah, because this is only the way we can make sure that our hand is in contact with the alcohol-based hand rub. All the areas are in contact, then only it is effective. Yeah. Okay, uh, next slide. All right, we have finished basically um, uh, talking about the, uh, the mode of transmissions and also so we know, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, PPE is one of the last resort that we have. Yeah. Okay. Last resort that we have. Yeah. And um, during the pandemic, the earlier the earlier phase of the pandemic, the supply of the PPE um, uh, affect us very badly. Yeah. Because um, you know everybody were panicking and. We, we don't expect the thing to be that huge. Yeah? So if we have problems with the uh, PPE supply. So in one article, in, in one WHO article, um, it is mentioned that to make sure that PPE is always available, we have to make sure all those things. Yeah? One coordinate PPE supply, I think this is the Joey group uh, is doing, yeah? and then Minimize PPE needs. Yeah, so uh, we have to make sure that, uh, 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 let's say, the number of the people taking care of the patient is uh, is not uh, unnecessarily more than what it should be. And then, of course, last but not least, yeah, use PPE appropriately. So to use PPE appropriately, we have to make sure that. The, the, the healthcare worker is properly guided, yeah? So next slide. Okay, uh, this is actually to show you the types of face masks available, yeah? Um, actually, the, the function of the face mask is to cover the user's nose, nose, mouth, and chin, yeah? Not only uh, um, um, nose and mouth, yeah, but also the chin area. And it is actually used as a physical barrier for the fluids. Yeah? Remember, fluids and particulate material in a certain efficiency. So uh, probably in the public, uh, for public use, um, WHO already endorsed the use of the basic cloth mask. Yeah? So uh, in let's say you want to go for shopping or just want to go outside, not in the medical facility, WHO said it's okay for you to use basic cloth mask, provided that it is three layers and it has the middle layers of filters inside. So it is okay. Yeah? But for the medical facilities, you have to use surgical face mask, yeah, which has three layers. And the outer layers is actually the waterproof layers. And one uh, thing that I have to mention here, if you notice, um, infection control will always um, ask people to use the in the medical setting in the in the hospital setting yeah to use the mask with the two ropes yeah so that um, it is you can adjust the tightness and then you can do the fit test properly yeah but um, many in the market now there are a lot of surgical masks with the yellow so you have to make sure that you are using the extender not hanging. Uh, or you just, um, you know, just um, uh, hang on your ears. Yeah? That will be very loose and it tends to drop every now and then. Yeah? So another thing that I have to mention here is that mask, you, once you wear the mask, the surgical mask or N95, whatever, you, you should not touch the outer layer of it. Uh, with your bare hand, yeah, because you, we consider that the outer layer of the mask is already contaminated. So make sure you wash your hand or you hand rub your hand, wear the mask, fit it properly, make it comfortable with you. And once you you satisfy with that, you should not touch that area anymore. Huh? Until you finish all your business, you have to throw it um, immediately and wash your hand. Yeah, that is the proper way of wearing mask. Basically, not you know um, uh, pulling it down and then wear it back uh, with your bare hand. Then we, you are actually contaminating your hand a lot. Yeah. Another thing I put here is full length face shield. Though it is not a mask, but the function is also 
to protect the fluids yeah, and splash. Yeah. So um, I, I, I put it here because in our guideline, uh, this is one of the important uh, PPE mentioned. Okay, next slide. Thank you. Okay, this is just to show various respirators protection available. Okay, next slide. All right. Uh, okay, I will touch about this thing later. N95 respirator, P100 respirators, safe contain breathing apparatus. This is not related to our medical um, facilities, like I just mentioned, and then full face respirators. Yeah. Next. Okay, this is basically N95. Yeah. N95. Um, is um, uh, the PPE, personal protective equipment that we use uh, to protect ourselves against airborne particles. Yeah? So uh, it is actually obtained from the fact that these types of masks uh, at least filter 95%, okay? 95% of aerosols yeah? uh, um, around 0.3. Remember, we said uh, airborne can be less than five microns. So N95 is very uh, practical because uh, the, the size of the filter is less than three, 0.3 micron. Yeah, and it has four layers. Yeah, of the all the various layers. Yeah? at least four layers. Yeah? So uh, the difference I have to mention here, the difference between, maybe you want to ask later, the difference between the surgical N95 and uh, ordinary N95. Yeah? Surgical N N95 is higher standard uh, little bit because it has the layer of the, of the water resistant. The, the outermost layer is water resistant. Yeah? So many at times uh, in subsequent slide, actually I'm referring to the ordinary N95 because uh, uh, it is uh, widely used now. And plus that in all the guidelines available, we use N95 with face shield. So that face shield will provide extra layers. So we don't actually need uh, uh, surgical N95 because the function is actually as a fluid uh, resistant, yeah? Thank you. Next slide. So this actually, this slide, um, um, discuss about the difference of N95, KN95, and KF94. Yeah. So as I mentioned, uh, N95 is um, uh, where the the PPE can um, filtrate the particulate about 95 percent. And the special things about N95, it is NIOSH approved. So. For the past year, um, uh, for the for year for the year of 2020, if you notice, we have problems with the N95 supply because because the the the, the outbreak is uh, the pandemic is uh, in a very uh, huge scale, so uh, the supply of N95 is very is very um, uh, is interrupted. Yeah, interrupted, and the 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 country who produced the and who produced N95 stop supplying N95 to the other countries. Yeah, so we have problem. So that is why, uh, uh, and and China produce a lot of KN95. Yeah, KN95 basically by by principle, it is the same in terms of the filtrations capability and all other things. Yeah. Uh, as N95. The only thing is that because they are, uh, KN95 is produced in China, they are not NIOSH approved. Yeah? But uh, many of the KN95 are actually uh, certified by the Chinese government. And in fact, in many hospitals in Malaysia, of course, at that time, now the condition is getting better. Yeah? We can get a lot of N95 already. But last time, we don't have enough supply, even though we have a lot of money to buy, but there is no supply of N95. So we have to go uh, to the KN95, which are actually equivalent to N95 and certified by, by the Chinese government standard. Yeah. So, um, and in fact, some of the uh, KN95 are actually endorsed or uh, endorsed by FDA under EUA, Emergency under uh, in the Emergency Use Act yeah, to use KN95 yeah, as a uh, equivalent to N95, Chinese equivalent N95. But the only problems, yeah, the only problem, another problem with KN95 is that um, they have a lot of frauds, yeah, 
fraudulent KN95, especially those uh, those uh, you know uh, sold on the uh, online all those things. So uh, be careful. Uh, there are a lot of KN95. You know, look similar, but they are not the same quality. So be careful uh, if you buy uh, online KN95 of the fraud things. Yeah. Another things that available also is KF94, which is a Korean uh, sort of Korean N94, lah, right? But this is actually uh, no, uh, not um, uh, because they don't even ask um, any, uh, any, uh, you know, um, certification from FDA or what. So they don't have any um, uh, FDA never grant them to to be equivalent or, or equivalent to N95. So, so uh, but you can see this thing is also available in the market. Okay. Next slides. So uh, P100 respirators is actually this thing, yeah, where um, uh, it's a type of um, uh, respirators that strongly resistant to um, oil and um, particulate where it can filter around almost 100 percent aerosol particles the only uh, i think uh, the, the the difference between the two is that n95 is single use you use it and you throw it away whereas this one you um, p100 you you use it you can you you can of course um, use it again, but you have to make sure you uh, clean it properly. Yeah, the problem with the cleaning, yeah, uh, outside and also the filters. Yeah, uh, I really afraid that um, this become can become the source of the infection to the user if the uh, uh, after you using that to see the patient people don't clean it, disinfect it properly. So that is another issue that we have to take care. Yeah. So easier N95 for N95 because we just use it and you just throw it away. All right. Uh, next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, this is not related. I think I just use uh, this one more relevant to the chemicals or, uh, you know, in for, for, for what uh, uh, situation, fire, uh, fire, Fire brigade, all those things. Yeah. Next slides. This is actually power PAPR, yeah? powered air purifying respirator. Okay. Mm, I touch this because this is also available in the in the guideline later. So this is actually the highest level lah, for the medical uh, medical setting. Yeah. Where it uh, actively using the uh, the battery, the power system to remove the air. Yeah, remove the air from the area that uh, we have here, so that uh, it is more comfortable, of course, uh, because uh, the air circulation is good. Yeah? but then um, al also the issues with the cleaning of the devices after use. This is another problem. Uh, we have to make sure that. The, all the devices is clean properly and the, the filters, and though the filter can be used uh, more than once, we have to really make sure it is um, disinfect properly. If not, then it can create another problem. Yeah. Uh, next slide. So uh, we finish with the, all the PPM masks and the respirators available. Hopefully, um, uh, okay, uh, you are okay with that explanation. So, recommended PPE guidelines uh, will be based on the ward setting, yeah, and risk assessment of the exposure, and of course, the type of transmission. Okay, uh, we discussed already type of transmission, right? So, ward setting and risk assessment of the exposure is very important for us to decide what PPE uh, uh, to use in the hospital setting. Next slide. So this is actually the, uh, the setting of the, 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 the requirement of the PPE in the hospital setting, not managing the uh, COVID-19 patient. So as you all aware, in Malaysia, we have three types of hospital. One is COVID hospital, another is hybrid hospital, and the other one is the non-COVID hospital. So ours now is categorized, USM is categorized as hybrid hospital. Lah. We manage both eh? COVID and non-COVID. So in areas that do not manage any patient, COVID patient, these are the 
PPE that we recommend and recommend our healthcare worker to wear. Okay. Um, surgical mask and sorry, sorry, before that, surgical mask and face shield. Yeah. So, um, but also have to make sure that the physical distancing, if uh, if possible, and also frequent hand hygiene. Yeah, frequent hand hygiene is something that we have to stress again and again and again because we know that it is also transmitted by contact transmission. Next slide. So, uh, another another condition is the where the activity is performing oral or nasopharyngeal swab for. Uh, suspected or probable confirm or, or confirmed COVID-19 patients. So these are the PPE that we uh, recommend our healthcare worker to use. One N95, yeah, because the activity when we want to do the swap, we consider that as somehow to some degree there will be a form of airborne generating procedure. Mm -hmm. So isolation gown, glove, face shield, head cover and boot. So this is the standard PPE that we ask people to use during the uh, sample collection for COVID-19 test. Next slide. So this, next, next, next. Okay, this is actually uh, in the ward setting, uh, COVID ward, where the patient are not intubated and able to wear surgical mask. So patient confirm COVID positive, okay, but patient is okay, okay, and patient can wear surgical mask. So these are the type of PPE that we ask people to use. One, surgical mask, only surgical mask, yeah, because uh, even though they are COVID-19 positive, but they, they, they are able to wear the surgical mask, yeah, All right. Um, isolation gown, glove, and face shield. Okay, even the boot, or boot cover they don't have to use because if if they are the patient are stable but they if they are anticipating a lot uh, for 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 a lot of um uh, let's say uh, spillage vomiting or whatever then they have to wear the boots yeah or boot cover also next slide next slide actually uh, showing the PPE for the patient who are not intubated but are not able to wear surgical mask, yeah? So patient, maybe patient are, uh, are you know, not comfortable, uh, feeling, you know, difficult or, or not cooperative. So all, if the patient cannot wear the surgical mask, then we ask the, N, the healthcare worker to wear N95, isolation gown, glove, facial, and head cover, yeah? Um, if you can see here, the, the, the healthcare worker also wear apron, but apron is actually if we, we see a lot of patient. So in between patient, we wear apron and we just remove the apron and the outer layer of the glove to see another patient, yeah, to, to, to avoid cross infection. So if only if you want to see only one patient, then you don't have to wear the, uh, the apron outside. Okay, the next slide will be on the patient's COVID-19 patient who are ventilated. Yeah? So if ventilated, then again, same. Huh? They have to wear N95, isolation gown, glove, facial, and head cover. Huh? All right. Mm, next slide. Next slide is for the aerosol generating procedure. So for aerosol generating procedure, we have three options. Yeah. Option number one, the best option. Of course, we go for the so first of all, we have to know, or I think all of you know already what are aerosol generating procedure, yeah? bronchoscopy, nebulization, yeah? extubation, intubation, activity, all those are actually aerosol generating procedures. So for option number one, the best option we will go for the PAPR yeah? um, uh, and coverall suit yeah? uh, and glove, facial and boot. Yeah, so uh, facial depends on type of PAPR lah. Um, many PAPR type they have already come together with the whole head gear, head cover. Then you don't have to wear the, the facial or Google. So, so uh, um, so these are the best option lah. Second option, next slide, will be uh, uh, also the coverall. Yeah, 
but with the N95, no need PAPR if you don't you don't have that. Eh? N95, glove, facial, and boot. Yeah. And option number three, the last option. Next slide will be the uh, using of the N95 isolation gown, plastic apron if uh, many patients, glove, facials, boot, and head cover. I think that's are all the uh, the important um, PPE for the various type of the uh, COVID patient based on risk assessment. Yeah, and next slides. Uh, issues on the PPE overuse and mis misuse, yeah, because uh, COVID nineteen um, comes together with fear, worries, and stigma, and this is very obvious everywhere. Yeah, in the ward, if one patient suddenly turned out to be positive, everybody start to panic. Just now or, or yesterday, when the result is not clear and not 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 ready yet, as every everybody still okay, relax. But then when the result positive, then we start to have all those fears, worries, and a lot of stigma, stigma comes together. So for that obvious reason, it is very important yeah, uh, to ensure PPE is used appropriately and not wastefully because if you uh, you worry a lot and you um, uh, wear a lot of unnecessary um, PPE, uh, then you will utilize a lot and you will consume a lot of PPE and that will be a waste of people's money actually. Yeah? Using a different or higher level of PPE than, than what is required is a form of misuse and uh, may affect the, the, the supplies yeah? uh, in adequate in futures. Yeah? And uh, next slides. And in summary, PPE does reduce rates of disease transmission and protect healthcare worker. And it is essential that healthcare worker understand the purpose of PPE and its role as part of a system to reduce disease transmission from patient to staff and other patient. And also some sometime probably from now because the, the COVID is already uh, uh, in the community, maybe from staff to the patients. Yeah? Uh, and it is equally important that the staff use it appropriately to preserve what may be limited uh, 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 to ensure that it is sufficient supply for necessary use throughout the epidemic and the, the epidemic search. With that, I thank you. Um, thank you very much. All right, um, thank you very much, Pro, for your sharing. Uh, I'm sure many will have uh, further questions for you later on. And uh, hence, uh, I would like to remind everyone and encourage everyone to scan the QR code that you see on the screen uh, for any of your questions, uh, and we will try to answer them at the end of the session today. Now, uh, when you scan the QR code, do provide us your email as well as in the event, we are not able to answer your question on time. We will try to respond the answers back to you by email later on. Um, uh, and now before we move to the next session, uh, we will take a short three minutes break. Uh, and in case some of you may need some water or bio break, um, uh, do uh, come back uh, right after that and uh, we will see you shortly. Thank you very much. Exclusive protection equipment with the most advanced technology to resist all the viruses has to be number one priority. Respocare N95 antiviral mask is the answer. This is the most reliable mask for us to be in contact with person on airborne precautions isolation. Its superior fit shape with the best quality of fabrics makes it comfortable to use without causing face skin allergy. Respocare N95 antiviral mask is the only N95 mask with antiviral property cleared by FDA that is not only observes the viruses and bacteria, but also inactivates them at one time. It is equipped with four layers design that give a maximal protection. The outer layer accelerates the absorption of infected droplets and brings infected droplet to the second antiviral layer to kill the virus. The third layer is the filtration layer that filtrate particles. 
The final inner layer consists the function of anti-fluid, which blocks the infected droplet completely in 5 minutes. With the special hydrophilic plastic coating, the infected droplet will be rapidly absorbed into the outer layer within 5 seconds. A low pH environment swiftly damages proteins and lipids on the surface of airborne viruses. The outer layer carries the viruses into antiviral layer, which contains functional group that mimic the binding of viruses to sialic acid on the surface of mammalian cells. The viruses trapped in this layer and are exposed to high local concentrations of ions, which inactivates the viruses through ionic interactions with proteins and RNA or DNA. Respocare N95 antiviral mask is highly effective against 18 seasonal and pandemic influenza. In addition to influenza viruses, Respocare inactivates a wide range of other pathogens including Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Respocare N95 antiviral mask is cleared by Food and Drug Administration FDA, approved by the Institute for Occupational Safety and Health NIOSH, and registered in Therapeutic Goods Administration, TGA. Respocare N95 antiviral mask protects you and your family. Now, next will be our awaited session for the day. And allow me to immediately introduce you to our next speaker. Dr. Arifin Mazuki bin Mokhtar is a registered anesthesiologist graduated from UKM in 2002. And he is currently lecturing at a medicine, uh, lecturing medicine at the School of Medical Sciences, USM. His clinical specialty is in cardiothoracic anesthesia and critical care with uh, a lot of interest in pain management in ECMO and also in mechanical circulatory support. Apart from clinical expertise, Dr. Arifin is a certified IT architect in business architecture, COVID-5 and TOGAF 9.1 certified as well. He also served as the ICT coordinator for USM where he coordinates the ICT initiative for the campus in terms of patient and student centricity, staff competency building, and also developing resilient knowledge management system. Previously, Dr. Arifin was a consultant anesthesiologist in IJN. So I hope there are a lot of IJN fans um, that has joined us today. Uh, mm -hmm. And he was also involved in the enterprise architecture, JCI, MSQH, ISO, and HACCP accreditation when he was the director of health informatics in IJN. Now, his interests are in the use of technology as the enabling tool to deliver high quality and safe care to patients. But um, today, his session will be a special one. Uh, and one that probably balances us up <laughs> with the emphasis mm -hmm. of technology and processes in the healthcare, but with a softer element of us being human and how our perspective changes when ourselves become a patient and on the receiving end of the system. And in Dr. Arifin's case, um, how his perspective changed as a caregiver when he became a COVID-19 patient himself. And I especially want to thank Dr. Arifin for agreeing to share his personal journey with us today. Uh, and uh, over to you now, Dr. Arifin. Okay. Thank you, Joey. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, excellent. Can. Right. Okay. Uh, thank you, Joey, for the very kind uh, introduction. And uh, thank you, everybody, for coming uh, this uh, or, or spending time with us during this uh, Saturday morning. Uh, before I start, I wish to thank IDS Med, Respoke, and InnoQ for the invitation. And thank you, everybody, again. And I hope uh, you enjoyed the session so far. Next slide, please. Uh, this is actually my topic. And I was given the task to share my journey uh, in the COVID-19 storm. And in my case, it was a cytokine storm in the intensive care. And I hope to cover these topics that uh, you see uh, in front of you on the slide. Um, first of all, um, I just wish to uh, share a, a story. One actually, one of my colleagues actually asked me, "Was the disease real?" 
And uh, because he saw these uh, pictures of people, you know, playing around, uh, mild symptomatic, because I, I don't think anybody would share their pictures in, in ICU. And it was real. And, and I can tell you that uh, I went through it. And um, here, what I wanted to do is uh, share how it changed my perspective, uh, being a patient rather than, you know, seeing the patient or as what my colleague, my other colleague told me, being on the other end of the needle, which is actually the sharp end. So before I, I move on, I wish to thank the uh, ICU, infectious disease, nursing, and also the healthcare providers in uh, HRPZ2 for taking care of me during uh, my stay in the hospital. And I would also like to thank USM and also Hospital USM that supported my family during the uh, trying times. Next slide, please. Um, this is a picture of me before COVID-19. Um, these are the times when uh, before the uh, MCG was put on, you can now you know, see that we were closer to each other. I've been a doctor for more than 25 years, uh, never been admitted unfortunately, um, and I've been a specialist for more than 19 years. I specialize uh, like what Joey mentioned just now, uh, and mainly I'm a clinician and I was involved with the advanced life support uh, for the patient. And I was also with uh, Prof. Soraya when we uh, did the initial uh, risk management uh, planning and uh, implementation of our COVID-19 response. And on the word of my uh, director, I was the, the best person to have the disease because I knew it from the start. Next slide, please. I guess I was, uh, I, as you can see here, we all of us are affected by pandemics. Uh, I just wanted to show you that uh, I'm used to wearing a mask in OT, but uh, since uh, the pandemic in way back in March uh, 2020, we have to wear masks in public and then washing hands with disinfectants and started to warn uh, those around me uh, about the disease and avoided crowded places, uh, closed spaces and all the, you know, the three W's and the three C's. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, uh, in November, uh, I had uh, symptoms and subsequently I was uh, PCR tested as positive. Uh, that resulted in 23 days of admission, out of which uh, seven days was in the intensive care, uh, which was described by the ID physician as a cytokine tsunami. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just to share with you uh, what happened, the, the cluster was reported on November 29th. Uh, the first case was positive on the November 24th, and uh, by 29th November, there were 21 cases. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, when the cluster ended uh, by January 8th, we have tested more than 1,100 individuals, and the total number of positives was 27. So the positivity rate was about 2.37%. Five out of the 27 were admitted into the isolated COVID-19 ward due to symptoms, and out of that, Three were admitted into ICU, two needed intubation, and one died. So I was uh, one of the three that was admitted to ICU because uh, we, I had to have a respiratory support. Next slide, please. Initially, in the first 12 days, uh, I had only mild symptoms. Uh, mainly, it was lethargy, myalgia, and dyspnea. Uh, it was just subjective, uh, dyspnea, and I, I was totally bored in the ward. Um, I just shared uh, the CVC uh, diagram that showed the type of progression of the disease. It can be very mild, uh, and, uh, and this was taken uh, from the initial episode in China. And however, you know, even though it can be mild, Next slide, please. Uh, I lost a dear friend and I put this uh, screen capture from one of the, uh, what do you call it, online newspaper that showed the barrier. And I was told that only the husband was allowed to accompany the, the body to the barrier. And this actually hit home uh, very close because uh, I was really close to her. Uh, she was uh, working in ICU together with me. Uh, and and she succumbed on the day I was discharged. Next slide, please. Um, just to show that actually I had a lot of time when I was in an hospital. Imagine that you're, you're put in a room by yourself and you, you have the, the slowest moving clock uh, on the wall. And, uh, and, and I have my computers, but I have a lot of time to actually reflect. And I think by the end, uh, after this, uh, after discharge, I became more philosophical and actually saw life in a different manner than, than 
and I saw it before this. And just to share something that related to my work and uh, that keep repeating itself uh, when uh, I was in the hospital. Next slide, please. I think I, I always have been telling people that, you know, um, our problem is not actually, uh, what do you call that? Uh, the, the, this Einstein quote actually sort of like uh, summarize it very well because, you know, we, we are so used to perfecting what we do, but we forgot why we do it. So that's actually the, the confusion of teams. And I am a part of a team that plans, implements. Importantly, we do competency building for healthcare providers. And uh, we monitor and report the healthcare management system for the USM. And uh, this as words from MSI actually summarizes the issue in chaos that we have. Uh, because what we do is that we firefight. You know, like when somebody we uh, got infection, we treat the infection. And then if uh, somebody needed an operation, we do the operation. But we're solving what is in front of us. But we never address the root cause of the problem. And then what we do is that we waste time and effort. And sometimes at, the, at, at some time, we actually pose serious risk to our patient safety. For example, like by not communicating well, you know, and, and isolating the patient and things like that. So I wish to uh, stress here that the main point that we as healthcare provider, we need to be clear why we work as a healthcare provider. And I, I wanted to define it as we are here to fulfill the patient needs and make sure that they are not harmed by the very medical treatment that we deliver to them. Next slide, please. And why I said that, because this is actually a, a quote that I took from uh, Professor Sir Cyril Chandler, because previously, medicine is, is about just giving medication and hoping people get well, but now we are more invasive. And we have a lot of invasive uh, procedures in our repertoire. You know, we can be very dangerous um, in terms of both diagnostic and therapeutic uh, interventions and working in intensive care and also cardiothoracic anesthesia. I put in a lot of lines, you know, uh, TEEs and things like that. And, and as I was being admitted, I was thinking like, will I be harmed by this? You know, like I can, I, they can put arterial lines, which actually they put. And will I be harmed by that? So that, that was the question that was going around in my mind. Next slide, please. And I put up this slide because I, I was very uh, was strict when it comes to uh, phone and videoing because uh, when, yeah, when, even when my you know, dearly departed wife was in ICU, I was holding on to her phone because I wanted her to rest and, and only give it to her when she, is, when she asked me for it. But when I was admitted, the phones are important lifelines, you know, like uh, the doctors would contact me when they want to interview me because of the isolation and then uh, um, video calls and that just to show that how I am doing. Uh, and then we use uh, a lot of video calls to actually talk to my family and that gives uh, them comfort because my family is also in quarantine. Uh, both the children are at home. Uh, people can't go in and out or help them because they have to be isolated. Uh, thank God that I had uh, my sister-in-law just uh, beside my house that actually looked after that because she was also isolated. And one of the things that I noted is that the fear, you know, like knowing that somebody was COVID positive and nobody wanted to go near the gate because they were, they were having uh, problems thinking that, you know, you might get it now. Um, another thing about uh, videos during the admission is that I use video logs as a coping mechanism, you know, to let off steam, to talk about it, things that I don't want to talk to anybody but I talk to camera. Of course, I'm not going to show mine. Uh, but I'm going to share some personal pictures during the admission. So I hope I will not be incriminating myself in the future. Uh, the pictures here serve uh, as a disclosure, as an example of the points that I wish to convey. And uh, I hope uh, it, it, don't worry, it's not going to be anything gross or anything like that. Next slide, please. Um, I wish to, for the sake of brevity, I'm just going to share a bit uh, of definition so it can give context. You know, like um, when I was in the ward, we do a lot of reflection, not actually taking photography, but, you know, going through serious thoughts of consideration. And uh, in the Malay or Arabic, it's known as muhasaba. You know, it's like a, there is a deeper meaning to it in which uh, I have to weigh between the good and the bad as all this, you know, uh, what you call life, events come flashing and and we I have to look at the good and the bad and then take lessons of it and try to improve myself and uh, that was a very good coping mechanism for me when I was in the world next slide please 
And uh, you cannot see a man's perspective until you walk in his shoes. And by the way, uh, I do have comfortable shoes when I'm uh, working because I stand a lot and I walk a lot during the day. But to empathize to, uh, uh, with the patient, now I know that one can only do that if you have experience in the same environment and exposed to the same race as the patient. And the worst thing is that the outcomes will affect you. Uh, as a patient, my outcome affects me because I can die and the doctor will not die. But being a doctor, uh, if the patient dies, we continue to live. It's different from being a pilot. If a plane crash, the pilot dies also. So what I wanted to say here is that you, uh, when I before I was admitted, when you talk about empathy and things like that, but you don't really feel it because it's like um, I've never been sick before, I've never been admitted before. Therefore, I can only see it from afar. Even as a carer, you don't really experience it. Uh, next slide, please. And my the definition or the medical parlance of a patient is that somebody who is registered to receive uh, medical treatment, but I, my perception actually changed because when I was a patient, my, I, I believe that, you know, being a patient is actually, you have to accept or tolerate delays, you know, problems and suffering without being annoyed or anxious because if you are annoyed or anxious, it makes it worse. So, and, and there was delays, there were problems and there was pain and, and, and suffering to a certain extent because of isolation. Imagine uh, 23 days uh, isolated in a ward, not even being able to go out to the, uh, what do you call that, to the yard, having the, you know, can only see a certain amount of uh, uh, view from the windows. And I was commenting to the nurse one day that, you know, even prison inmates actually get time to exercise outside. But as patients, we are actually bound to the isolation ward, which is probably around six meter by six meter. And, and that actually causes a lot of grief. And the last uh, word that I wanted to uh, share here, the next slide, please, is actually about being vulnerable. And even though I was actually not really that sick initially, I was vulnerable because I was isolated. Uh, I was under, when I was in ICU, I was in pain. I needed uh, oxygen support. I was under anesthetic in infusion. And uh, that actually altered my mental capacity because of the influence of the drug. Next slide, please. So just to share some of the, uh, what do you call that, what I went through, uh, I took this picture as a screenshot from the video that I made uh, on the way to uh, the hospital from the ambulance. So I made a video just in case, you know, might be the last video that I ever made. Um, in my mind, uh, seeing all the viral videos that people uh, put up on social media when somebody was, uh, you know, uh, being taken for uh, COVID isolation, you know, seeing that you no know, ambulance siren blaring, lights flashing, and um, what do you call that? Everybody was 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 sharing it on social media, and I can imagine my neighbors actually doing that. But in my case, they were very discreet. Uh, I was take, uh, I was taken to the hospital at 11 uh, p.m. Uh, they actually kept in good communication. They contacted me. They told me about the results. They say they plan to take me uh, to the hospital within a certain hour, and then the ambulance is going to come from where. And then uh, when they come to the uh, what do you call main road uh, or to the lorong to, near my house, they told me to be ready. And and they come in, and the ambulance was actually darkened, and they only and, and everybody was in uh, full, uh, what do you call that, uh, PPEs. But uh, they, they kept it toned down. So I, I was really, uh, what do you call, impressed by that. And uh, and uh, you should, I said the usual goodbyes because I don't know whether I'm coming back home or not, seeing at the, 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 the risk of uh, getting complications from uh, COVID-19 is uh, a lot. But I can't really, you know, touch my children because I was already isolated at that time and they are waiting for their swap. So... And there was no drama, just like, you know, went into the ambulance and then after that, they only turned the lights uh, on the main road and I was really happy. And the good thing here is that because they communicated and so there was no drama, uh, essentially, and, and that was good. Uh, next slide, please. And this is actually the two pictures that I wanted to uh, share in terms of, this is 
20 days of admission, this is my view. I can count how many ambulances went in and out from the emergency department because the ward is situated in front of the emergency department. Initially thought that this is uh, the, the left-hand picture was my escape route, but I came to note that the door was bolted shut, so I couldn't run away. Uh, the next view on the right is actually the second bed inside the isolation room. So they have the two-stage isolation room with an empty room and they put a, a you know, less severe patient in this bed. Uh, however, when I was there, this bed was not uh, used. Except uh, at one night, one of the patients was actually transferred from ICU, but he was again transferred back to ICU the next morning. And, and one thing that hit me was the isolation and as the patient was going back, me being the anesthetist, when they were resuscitating the patient, can I help? And the nurse actually turned to me and said, doctor, you have to remember, you're a patient now. So just don't care about the other patients. You are a patient, so you stay in your room. So, and 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 sort of like I went back in my room and said, yeah, I'm not working here and, and I'm also sick. And, and seeing that patient being transferred back to IC was like, that could be me. And little that I know that I was going to have the same problem then. And the, one of the good things that uh, I learned was that to have a on-suit uh, toilet was really good because uh, I was tired. I can't really move uh, too far away. And because if I were to go far, I, I would get uh, very distinct. Next slide, please. Hospital foods are very uh, bad. Um, if you notice that the left side is actually not hospital food, that was what I wanted to eat. So I ordered from uh, you know the food delivery. Unfortunately, I couldn't eat it because of one of the symptoms that you have a loss of taste and smell, and and it, it could have been just stale bread because I can't really feel anything at it. So. Uh, usually I have uh, two modes of eating, one to fill up and the other one is to sort of like mm, feel the taste of the food or, or you know, but um, just to show the right side is actually my sustenance in the hospital and this is the best food that they actually serve because I can, I can sort of like, you know, taste it as it goes down and it was soft. I can't really, I had a uh, problem with swallowing so that on that most of the time I actually ask for this and this is a treat because this is like the best food apart from crackers crackers are lifesavers you know and and that, that was so funny because I always thought that hospital food are bad but the 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 booboo on the side that is actually the one that really 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 helped me next slide please uh, I was on high dose steroid therapy and uh, this is actually a screen capture of how I looked just before I was admitted into ICU. I mean, I had, uh, I was put on dexamethasone and uh, methylprednisolone and a little known side effect of dexamethasone is hiccups. Uh, it was reported uh, and, and I had a very bad bout of it. And, uh, and one of the things uh, in this video, which I took the screen capture, I was actually videotaping myself and I was having hiccups and that shoot the bed. It's like getting a <laughs> And, and 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 that was really bad until in, at one time I had severe chest cramps. And I'm going to talk about that later. But the other thing that happened was that my sugar level was haywire, so I had to start be started on uh, subcutaneous insulin. And you must understand, one of the treatment for COVID is actually anticoagulation. So I was on a full dose of uh, Clexin, which is a blood thinner. And what happened was that the uh, I had to take two injections, you know, like one is for clexin, the other is insulin. And that actually helped uh, with to control my blood sugar. Next slide, please. And uh, on the 12th day of admission, I had a cytokine release tom where there was a very bad inflammation. I had high grade fever, had uh, shortness of breath, uh, had a very severe retrosternal and infra inter interclavicular pain. I was put on uh, intravenous analgesic. I needed oxygen uh, because my saturation was going. And then I had these bouts of cramps uh, where I can't breathe and was gasping because, you know, have you, if you have felt cramps in your leg, imagine your whole chest was cramped. You can't really uh, inhale or exhale. Oh, that was very terrifying. And I think that was the time that I look at, I could have died, you know, that like maybe this is like death. And, 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 and the nurses are looking at me and, oh, doctor, are you okay? Doctor, are you okay? And I was like, you're not, you don't need to intubate me. You don't need to intubate me. <laughs> uh, as though that meant uh, anything because, you know, that if they decided to intubate, they would just uh, knock me out with the medication. And, um, but 
Alhamdulillah, um, I, I was uh, uh, put in uh, again in isolation and ICU. And uh, after a day, they, they probably think I was going crazy or something like that. They, they transferred me to a shared room where we have other four other patients. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, in this uh, patient, uh, in, the, in that room, uh, there were four patients. Uh, fortunately, there is a window. And, and I think this is something that I had uh, experience myself because before this we were thinking like when we design ICU you know you have to have window to ensure that you have the diurnal uh, rhythm blah 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 so that you don't have get delirium and I was using these two window as my reference on day and night because ICU the lights was always on and that avoided ICU delirium uh, the, the funny part about being in ICU is that uh, all three other patients had hallucination. They were, uh, and they were telling me, Doctor, nampak tak hantu tu. Doctor, there's a ghost underneath my bed. And I was like, what hantu? Where? I don't see anything. Uh, so my point is that because I was looking through the window and orienting, orientating myself to day and night, and, and you know, doing knowing that uh, I, I this is night, this is day, that avoided I, I delirium. And and um, the way I look at it now, or the way that I do when I'm practicing now, is that I tell my patient now, you know, this is, this is uh, daylight, it's now daytime, this is nighttime, things like that, to help them in orientating uh, themselves. Next slide, please. Uh, I was on high flow nasal cannula. Uh, in, uh, good thing they didn't intubate me. I think the intensivist was telling me that if you were. Uh, Cooperative, you're uh, prone, uh, and and the uh, the nasal cannula works. You're not going to intubate you. So I was like, yeah, okay. So I followed to the letter. I think uh, I was trying to be cooperative. I hope I wasn't a tyrant when I was uh, a patient. You know, like because you know doctors make the worst patients. So this is how the high flow nasal cannula looked like. Mm. One thing that happened to me the at three a.m. the reservoir. Uh, ran dry so it was that was very painful uh, it was searing uh, it was like you know having fire in your nose and 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 the nurses were very uh what do you call diligent and they saw that they immediately changed the reservoir and fill it up and and that lasted for a few uh minutes only and and that was lucky so now i can tell everybody that you know you must keep the reservoir full otherwise the patient will go into a very bad uh, state because it was very painful. Next slide, please. And uh, I, I gave Joey a piece of my mind when I came out to ICU because I was telling her, your alarms drove me bonkers because, you know, the, the ICU, you know, have, we have these beeps and alarms that you're supposed to alert us about abnormal parameters. So I usually tune it out when I was uh, what you call working and, and people have a term for it. They call it alarm fatigue. <laughs> but from the bed, it's, it, it started as a, an annoyance. But by the end of the third day, it was like, uh, making me crazy so it was really good so and then uh, because there were four patients so the the monitor sort of like gang up and become a symphony like uh, first uh, one would start and then after another and, and and that drove me bonkers so i included in this picture that little red thing underneath there that's actually my uh noise cancelling headphone which was a god sent um I don't know. I don't think I, I could, could have survived uh, psychologically in ICU if I don't have that uh, headphone because that was the one that I used to tune out the, the alarms. So the good thing about this is that the staff was very good. They were alert. I actually told the intensivist and he actually asked the staff to actually change uh, the, the alarm settings. So then we couldn't actually, they, they stopped the alarm in the patient's room, but, but you know, crank up the alarm in the staff uh, room because the staff is actually not in the room because it's an isolated room. Uh, next slide, please. A little bit about lines. Um, arterial lines are very painful. So now every time I put an arterial line, it's under arterial, under uh, what do you call ultrasound guidance with uh, lots of local analgesics because uh, it is very painful. But taking care of the alarm, I used to blame patients, you know, like your lung line uh, is um, bang because you were moving too much. <laughs> and to keep the lines painted is a chore. So I can re I realize that. And, and the sighting of the lines are very important. So now when I do my practice, uh, I sight the lines uh, more proximally, not at the creases because if uh, the patient really have to hold it and things like that. And, and the lines serve like a, you know, like a restraint because I can't really move without the line, especially when I'm prone. Because at that time, the, 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 the lines actually don't allow you to move. Um, 
the good thing about uh, being a Muslim is that we can actually take tayammum. So uh, that that helps with ablution. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is actually my view. I can only see the wall and the oxygen. And this is uh, my lifeline. Electricity and oxygen. Electricity to charge the phone, to for the machines, uh, the monitors and things like that. And the oxygen is actually the one that kept me breathing or the saturation up. And I was uh, unique because I was prone. So I can only see this. Uh, otherwise, it would be a, a, a less appealing uh, visual of the ceiling with its uh, sprinklers and the uh, air outlets. So yeah, just to, to share. Because we don't see this when we are looking at the patient because we always, uh, uh, in, in my case, when I see the patient, I would be like standing up and looking down at the patient. I never actually look up and see what they are seeing. Um, well, I can tell you after like seven days, uh, I really love to go to the seaside. In fact, after I was discharged, uh, immediately I went to the seaside just to, you know, take away the craving. Next slide, please. So uh, one of the things that happened to me, I was on prone. So the, the venti mask causes a big problem because it was like, a, you know, similar to an elephant trunk. So when I, I was having a lot of fatigue when I was wearing it the right way. So what we had to do is actually change it so that the, the, the trunk actually goes up like that. So I was feeling like I was an elephant with the trunk going up high in the air, something like that. And... Uh, the, the main reason for that is to avoid, uh, I had sore neck and uh, and a lot of things because they have to use a venti mask to wean down from the high fluence of the cannula. And um, what do you call that? So now I, I, I look at it from the point of perspective that if you can really modify and, you know, ask the patient whether they have problems or not, rather than, you know, like, please, you have to tolerate it because, you know, tolerating a venti mask for 24 hours or 48 hours, you, you get a lot of sore neck. Uh, next slide, please. This is uh, a picture of the slowest uh, clock uh, ever invented by men. Um, and they put the clock right in front of the bed. So I was very happy to be in the isolation ward after I was transferred out from ICU. It's uh, one o'clock in the morning. I was very happy to go to the toilet because you can't go to the toilet in ICU. They don't have toilet in ICU. They have to do everything. Uh, the CBD was very painful, very embarrassing. But after a while, because I was so tired, I couldn't even do anything. So embarrassment was the least of the problem. Anyway, so um, I think the shower was great after that. And uh, next slide, please. Just to end the presentation, just to show the aftermath uh, of, of what I had. I was on full dose glaxin, can be cannulated the aortic line, and had a big hematoma, which is actually the center picture that took about, I think, a month, a month to go out. Uh, off and then I had thrombophlebitis. My shoulders was I felt like Arnold Schwarzenegger, but it was painful because of a hematoma. Uh, but you know, these are the things that you know we don't read uh, as an anesthetist. I don't see it because I was in ICU, and when the patient is taken later in the ward, I don't go to see it. So I said, Yeah, patient has got a lot of problems. So just to summarize the next slide, please. Um, what I've done just now is actually explore all these facts uh, by uh, showing you examples of what I went through. Uh, the first one is actually respect about patient values where they were very discreet uh, in, in taking me to the hospital, avoided all the drama of going down. There were, there were a lot of coordination and integration of care because uh, the, the team that took care of me uh, ranging from you know medical, ID, respiratory, uh, then uh, uh, ICU, nursing, uh, there was psychological support, the uh, psychological first aid. So there was a lot of integrating integration of care and uh, coordination. I was lucky because uh, communication was, uh, information was communicated to me, uh, probably because I'm also a healthcare provider. So they probably, they think it's easier for me to talk to, talk to me using the same terms rather than translating. Education is very important because even though I was, I am an intensivist, but I have no experience uh, managing a COVID patient. And, and the ID physician was, you know, educating me about steroid use, what have they have learned, physiological basis for certain escalation of treatment and things like that. Uh, physical comfort is very important uh, in the sense that the good thing about ICU bed is that they are designed like a cocoon. So I, I've never uh, slept in one. And what I what I felt when I was uh, prone on it was like it envelops you, so you can't really move. So that, that was a good feeling, you know, like a warm, uh, what do you call that, uh, bed to, to go through. But I don't want to repeat the, the, the experience. Emotional support is very uh, important because you need to, you know, 
really fear and LA anxiety. There was a lot of it. Uh, COVID affects the psychology more uh, than, than the physical content because mainly I wasn't even sure that what I was going through until I went out of ICU because I was just concentrating on, you know, one day at a time and things like that. And involvement of family and friends are very important, especially for COVID because, you know, like in the contact tracing and then communication and things like that. And um, just to end uh, this, uh, the next slide, please. The ID physician actually sent this to me and um, that sort of like, you know, puts it into perspective that even though I may not be a good doctor, but I'm sure that I have impacted somebody's life. And, and for that, I was spared a few things when I was in ICU. And, and that sort of like brings the perspective, you know, you, you get closer to religion when you know that you are about to die or going to die. And you know that your mortality is actually at stake here. So I think this is a very good quote that she actually sent to me. And the next slide, please. Um, now, um, I always tell myself, my staff that we have to continue to improve ourselves and we have to continue to learn as we practice. And practice is more important than just theory. And then relieving or going through the experience actually change how I see myself, not just as a physician treating, but as a partner to the patient rather than uh, being, you know, the, the all-knowing physician that tells people what to do. No, it's more towards a collaboration now. And this can actually be by design and shouldn't be left by chance. Uh, by chance. And I guess the important aspect in which what we are doing here is actually competency building activity for healthcare providers and also uh, the change management. We need to you know, facilitate people uh, to change in this trying time. Next slide. And this is actually my last slide. And as you can see, uh, change is upon us. Uh, if you look at the, the first slide that I had, uh, we were closer together, we were, we were uh, in contact and we don't have face shields. Now we use uh, N95s uh, in, in, in the uh, operating theater when we do AGPs, we have to wear face shields and things like that. And the way I look at it, life does go on. Um, and, uh, you know, we need additional protection. I've been vaccinated. My first dose was actually three weeks ago. And I'm going to take the second dose next Monday. And uh, I hope that everybody also do the same because uh, somebody asked me, even though I've got antibodies, why do I have to be vaccinated? Well, actually, I asked the same thing to our physician, uh, uh, infection disease. And, and she said that, you know, the vaccination actually helps in, in, in reducing if ever, I hope I don't get the second, uh, what do you call it, infection. Uh, so that you know the, the outcome is better. So I wish to end my presentation here. Thanks uh, for spending your morning with us. Uh, stay strong, uh, stay safe, and uh, together we can actually get through this. Uh, thank you, Joey. Over back to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Arifin. Wow, I, I think there was like so much that you went through, right? In the one experience of you becoming a patient, though like prior to that, you didn't have an experience, but I think it all came together in that one experience that gave you all this, you know, that you are able to share with us today, right? And um, really, thank you very much for, for you know, um, being so open, you know, with your sharing today. Um, so, I mean, for, for just to share with everyone else, right, like Dr. Arifin is also a personal friend to many of us. Um, and we were all very concerned when we heard that, you know, he was warded. But we are very glad to see today you are well, you are good. And you are able to share with us, you know, um, uh, with us today. So thank you very much, Dr. Arifin. You're welcome. Right. So um, now we will come to the Q&A session of the day. Um, so there are a couple of questions that um, uh, we have kind of like collected from the participants. Um, but maybe, uh, Prof, you know, we would like to start off uh, with yourself, right? Um, one of the things that was raised is that um, the participants would also like to know what is actually the main challenge that we face, right, or you face, uh, when you were deploying the PPE and implementing, you know, some of the guidelines during this COVID situation, and uh, how did you overcome some of this? Uh, Prof, I think you are you are muted. Prof, you want to unmute yourself first? Right. Uh, okay. Thank you, Joey. Um, uh, that question actually uh, reminds me the the heart work that we do in the whole 2020 yeah so um 
initially our hospital is not a COVID hospital or not a hybrid, even hybrid hospital. We are non-COVID hospital, but at that time we have enough um, uh, panic, you know, because um, uh, we, we can't, you know, uh, when the patient comes with a severe acute respiratory infection, we can't really differentiate whether the, this patient is going to be COVID positive or not. So the 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 the, um, the compliance to specific PPE is already there, and in fact, we actually, uh, like you mentioned, we have actually. Uh, uh, utilize a lot of same other, like other hospital. I think we actually at that time you we use up a lot of PPE uh, uh, just to make sure that everybody is protected. You know, but and 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 at that time, uh, I think middle of 2020 we have. Yeah, I think everybody faced the same problem, a crisis where the PPE is not enough. You know, when we try to, uh, uh, you know, find all the resources, but I mean, in terms of uh, monetary, we have quite a, you know, enough money to buy the PPE, but the supply is not there. And then the supply, if if it is there, the cost, the, the, the price is more than triple, you know, times than the initial one. So we, we actually uh, end up with um, making, sewing our own PPE at that time. <laughs> and happened that during the first lockdown, we have uh, quite numbers of a lot of staff who, who, who can work from home. They, wow. they voluntarily come and become the tailor for the hospital. You know? uh, that kind of thing happened. Uh, so, um, and uh, together, I think uh, Arifin, Arifin was also there uh, that time. We, you know, we create the guideline and we do the root show to each and every department who directly involved with the, with the patient management to actually educate people to comply what uh, PPE you should um, you know uh, uh, wear and not supposed to wear and and, and also um, uh, because um, PPE is related to adequate knowledge on donning and doffing also so many at times people also uh, you know afraid that they will, and of course, they can contaminate themselves while, uh, you know, removing the, uh, the the PPE. So that kind of things, uh, we have to go and again and again and again do the road show to every department and come. And until now, until now, like uh, for NS department now, who actually taking care of the COVID ward, they, they have the two weeks rotation. Every new batch come in, they will come to our unit to make sure they are properly um, well trained on the uh, donning and doffing of the PPE and by sequence. And, and you know that PPE, each and every type of PPE, we have to have a good hand hygiene in between. So all those things we actually teach again and again and again, plus all the video um, supplements to them so that everybody are very comfortable with their uh, procedures. Then only they can be very confident to go and manage the patient in the COVID ward. Understand that. All right. Thank you so much, Prof. Now, the next question, Dr. Arifin, to you is that um, after what you have gone through, um, will you be able to share some of the processes that you think you know you, you would recommend to change or if you were to design a hospital, um, you know, the workflow or the design of the room, what will you change or what would you recommend? Just a brief one on that, Dr. Arifin. Uh, thank you, Joey. I think that one is a three day and three nights course for <laughs> hospital design and architecture. Uh, well, uh, what we do here is that we 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 actually in the middle of you know uh, modeling and implementing a digital hospital for USM, and uh, there, there's a lot of uh, what you call changes in terms of the patient flow. We are looking at cohorts of patient, uh, integrated care, uh, what do you call that uh, integrated therapy units. We call them that uh, cover cohorts, and the uh, one of the 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 earlier cohorts that we are doing is actually for cardiothoracic uh, uh, acute coronary syndrome patients and that's in progress uh, apart from just looking into the patient uh, flow we are also looking into the costing by using activity-based costing because that's very important for us uh, because we are reliant on government grants now uh, if you ask me about you know designing an ICU uh, I still have to be open uh, in back in 2009 I had the pleasure to uh, visit Kutek Park Hospital in in uh, 
Singapore and uh, the design of the hospital it was a, a very good environmentally friendly and very uh, you know ecological sounding uh, 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 frame as uh, uh, grounded frame uh, of design where mm. the the center Central core is actually where the utilities are and the patient's bed are by the windows. And, and I find that this, uh, in my experience, the, the daylight actually helps uh, to, to keep the patient oriented. And that that was actually, and, and Kutepat is actually one of the hospital that was, uh, what do you call that, uh, being mm. uh, lauded as one of the best ecologically sound or zero emission mm. hospital in Singapore. So I would, I would, you know, incorporate that. And in fact, we are also designing a hospital which is situated by the river for uh, geriatric, uh, which mm -hmm. will be coming in the next few years. And, and we incorporated this, you know, like more family, the, the, the rooms are shared, uh, it's not isolated rooms and the patient when they are on their bed, they're isolated from, uh, mm -hmm. you know, they have privacy, but when they're standing, they're in a community. So those are the things that, 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 that we incorporate. And I talk more to the patient now, uh, especially, uh, you know, explaining about the arterial line. I showed my <laughs> hand, uh, uh, this is uh, what I went through. So I know what you're going to go through and it will not be too uh, painful because I, I, I use ultrasound things like that. So I hope that sort of like gives a, a, a concise uh, answer to that but if you want to know more then uh, come to the architecture competency, competency building and then we'll, we'll talk about processes and procedures <laughs> uh, Professor Raya is laughing already <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, probably this can be our next topic, you know, in our next session. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. So, um, uh, next question, uh, uh, Prof, this question is actually for you. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, uh, the participant actually uh, highlighted that, you know, a patient was admitted, a PCR result actually came later, and the patient was actually positive, and there was a total lockdown, right? Um, so the patient is not allowed in and out, but then the staff was actually moving in and out. So um, what is your comment in this, right? What is the proper way, you know, to kind of like lock down the situation? So maybe we can comment on that, Prof. So I suppose this happened in hospital that you don't have proper COVID ward, right? Because if uh, like in our setting, uh, once the patient um, positive, then the patient will be transferred to the designated uh, COVID ward. So no, no, other people have no worries about that. But then uh, go back to that question. Okay, of course the patient, okay, in that setting, the patient was there and then the total lockdown for the patient, no in out of the patient, but the, the, the staff, Okay, the rule number one, of course, uh, we have to minimize the number of staff involved. But then still the patient, the staff can be, um, uh, no, since the, the staff is taking care of the patient, of course they can be in and out, but provided that the, patient, the staff is compliance to the um, PPE guidelines and hand hygiene, street hand hygiene, and also environmental cleaning. So um, uh, like in our setting, the, if they're in the COVID ward, the patient, the staff after the after their duty, they go back home, no problem. But then during the patient management, they have to be very compliant to the PPE guidelines mm -hmm. and hygiene and the environmental cleaning. Shouldn't be any problem. Okay, all right. Thank you. If I if okay. I may add, mm -hmm. this happened to us. Uh, my my children were were not uh, infected. So I was the only one in, uh, infected and my family mm. was not infected because we were, we were following the, the procedures and protocol. I.e. when I go home, I mean, the first thing I do is that uh, straight uh, take a shower, uh, disinfect the clothes and then the, all my, my hospital clothes are actually wash, uh, what do you call that, uh, separately. And, and what happened when I was tested positive, the whole unit was actually identified as CC1, CC2 and then everybody was tested. So we, we, we closed the unit for a few days until everybody's result came back. And uh, you know, but but we had a scenario for that, isn't it, uh, Professor Raya? I remember that if a staff uh, had uh, become positive, what to do? And that's the reason why the 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 swap or the retesting was a lot. I mean, for twenty seven positive out of one thousand one hundred plus uh, staff was actually did. And what we what happened at that time was that we identified very early the nidus of the infection, and then only uh, the the immediate family was affected. So it didn't go or blown up proportion. So what happens uh, in that question was that, you know, if you follow protocols and procedures and you have scenarios, uh, what to do, how to escalate as, as things happen, you can actually contain it. So that's my comment. All right, thank you very much. 
Um, uh, the next question is uh, to Dr. Arifin. Um, uh, you mentioned that patient safety is one of the main concerns in healthcare management. So mm. um, uh, do you think it's compulsory to screen those who want to enter the hospital environment, particularly to those who wants to be caretaker of the patient? So um, what yeah. do you think about that? Ah, excellent question. Uh, it happened to me a few days ago uh, because I'm from Kelantan. I'm working in an area where all my the, my relatives and family members are in uh, here. And uh, one of my, uh, what do you call that, a, family, uh, a, a close family uh, was actually admitted to be done a procedure and his son came from KL. So what his son wanted to do is come to the hospital and take care of his father because that's what is required culturally here. Uh, we, we, uh, the hospital actually took an escalated response to all this, uh, i.e. it's not just about screening, it's actually uh, steps, uh, uh, what you call escalated steps of, of uh, uh, what you call putting in control so that uh, people who are infected does not uh, go or, or is let loose into the hospital environment. So we create the hospital mm -hmm. environment to be free of COVID uh, or if, uh, apart from from the COVID uh, ward, which is actually on the eighth floor, or the whole floor is actually isolated. So uh, first is actually declaration. Uh, uh, it's not mm -hmm. just about screening. So I'll just explain. Uh, declaration, you have to declare where you come from, whether you have symptoms and things like that. If you come from a red zone, we ask for a, either a PCR or an RTK. And, and those are very important because we don't ask everybody to have RTK or PCR, but those at risk or coming from uh, red areas have to be uh, screened. And symptomatic is very important important temperature is done uh, in and out or we identified all our excess routes so that we put a, a, a thermal, thermal scanning uh, what do you call it, camera in the most uh, or the busiest sites uh, mm -hmm. like parking and things like that but uh, in every front entry there is a temperature check so that we so it's actually a, a, a series of escalated steps to prevent uh, what do you call that COVID positive individuals from coming to the hospital because once uh, the individual is let uh, free to roam in the, ho the hospital it can cause an, a lot of infection that's what happened in other hospitals uh, as you probably would have known now mm. um, caretakers are, are very important because these are the people that goes in and out of the world so we we, uh, we tell them that you know you have to be in isolation try not to expose it because if then you're not going to expose yourself so a lot of education competency building putting up controls in a serious manner and then putting up escalations so that when yeah. we uh, you know it's about detection and avoidance rather than you know screening just by on its own right that's all joey <laughs> thank you dr <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, okay, uh, next question to uh, Prof, right, um, uh, the participant would like to know um, uh, whether it's possible if they are using a KN95 product that has only passed, you know, the test for the penetration, right, of the N95, so it's not like certified surgical N95, um, can they actually use it together with a surgical mask, you know, like in combination uh, to manage the, the patient with a salary of, or, or yeah or patient under investigation. So what do you think? Um, KN95, as I mentioned, um, um, many of them that um, um, pass through the uh, uh, proper uh, company will have a proper certification by Chinese government, which is stated to be equivalent to uh, equivalent to N95, uh, NIOSH um, certified. So mm. the problem is that now uh, people scared uh, whether uh, it is enough protection or not. But I have to say that if it is um, a, a, a KN95 that properly uh, uh, passed by the Chinese government, it is actually safe to just go with the KN95. But the problem is that probably you have to look at the, the because some of the design, design you have to really do the uh, fit, you have to uh, wear it properly. Yeah. And also the the ear loop one. Ear loop mm -hmm. one is a tricky, little bit tricky because you really need to have uh, the extension. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, if people are afraid of the extra protection for the splash, then that is why in all the guidelines, it comes uh, K KN95 or N95 come with the face shields. Mm -hmm. That will be enough. So, mm. uh, uh, but I know uh, there are a lot of actually. If you read the um, uh, publication, there are a lot um, uh, people um, uh, apa, discussing about this. But now I think the, the earlier part, people is actually try to save N95. That's why they use uh, surgical mask so that 
N95 can be used multiple times. Yeah, so okay. that's why they put another extra layer. And another problem is that they, they feel that it is not tight enough. Uh, some they feel yeah. uh, the, the IK N95 is loose. That's why okay. they try to hook with the uh, surgical mask at the outer layer. But talking whether it is needed or not, whether it is necessary okay. or not, it is not actually. If okay. you wear it properly and make sure you fit the KN95, of course, not the fraud one, not the fake one, the, mm -hmm. the, the one certified by the Chinese government. Yeah. Uh, put it properly and then uh, tie it uh, enough, you know, you already comfortable with that. It shouldn't be any problem. So it needs to be a tight fit, yeah. Okay, thanks, um, uh, Prof. Now, another question uh, to you as well, Prof, uh, is if that say the, co uh, the patient is COVID uh, with uh, antibody um, uh, positive, yeah. but the PCR is actually negative. Mm -hmm. So do we take care of this patient in the normal ward or in the sari ward? In the no normal ward. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> sari means okay. Uh, severe acute respiratory infection, means that all the symptoms, but then um, that will be a uh, positive antibody must be treated, I mean, um, cured patients uh, previously, whether documented or not documented subclinical uh, COVID infection maybe, but the patient anyway have the antibody towards COVID-19 mm -hmm. um, without any symptom, I suppose. Uh, mm -hmm. Or, or uh, if if the patient have severe acute respiratory infection, then it should, should be managed in the SARI ward. But then okay. if the patient had come for some other medical problem in the general ward, in the other ward. Okay, understand that. Now, due to time, we'll take uh, two more questions, right? Um, uh, uh, so this uh, last question for you, Prof. Um, is there any guideline when to change the P100 filter and what is the best way to disinfect the P100 respirator? It depends on the, um, uh, the recommendation by the company. Okay. Uh, every company or, or design of that P100 come with their own um, uh, recommendation. Okay. Mm. All right. Uh, and uh, last but not least, um, uh, Dr. Arifin, uh, somebody here is is curious to know, did you really lose your um, taste and smell during your period as a patient? But <laughs> well, yes, I did. I lost both. Uh, I, I lost my both smell and taste. Uh, and I only recovered like after six weeks uh, after discharge. And uh, it was funny. Uh, some, uh, some of the other patients actually, it, it went on until uh, six months. And uh, there was a lot of uh, variations in, in terms of uh, what you call when it came back, uh, the anosmia. Some of them actually smell things that are unpleasant, you know, like, like uh, smelling of feces and things like that. Uh, fortunately, I didn't have that. But uh, when I had a loss of taste and smell, uh, I, can, I can smell uh, lemon. Uh, that, that's the only thing that I can differentiate because uh, uh, that was the one that I took uh, lemon and honey when I was in the ward that, that actually hydrated and then gave me energy. The other one is that uh, the food tastes differently. Uh, it's like uh, it can be either too, too uh, what do you call that, masin or very, very salty, or sometimes it doesn't, it tastes very bland, you don't feel anything. And, and sometimes it, it, it's uh, obnoxious, you know, like you have that you know, very, uh, I can't describe, uh, unpleasant taste uh, that, that, that sort of like, you know, like avoided it. it is, and most of the time, it's actually uh, pahit. You know, mm. you felt like, yeah, it, it was okay. uh, pahit. So that, that's how I, uh, I can explain it. But, you know, I, I have two modes of eating, one to fill up and the other to taste. So I was on my filling up mode most of the time when I was in, a, in the ward. So it's just now you getting can the taste food. all your nasi krabu well and good, yeah? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That was like... Uh, that was a uh, <laughs> what do you can uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, I, I can only get that budu after six weeks you know like <laughs> I wow. was like coffee everything <laughs> okay uh Prof, just one last question which uh, I find it quite, quite interesting so the last question is like um after two dose of vaccination uh so will the healthcare workers still need to wear a 95 and face you while at work yeah, <laughs> still, yeah, that I think uh, understandable because we, we we don't know how the virus work actually because this is new to us and I think the best still we have to protect everybody, protect us and protect everybody by the proper. Okay, right. Thank you, Prof. Now, um, uh, so we have now come to the end of our session. Uh, Dr. Arfin and Prof, thank you so much. Uh, any last words of message that you'd like to give to our 600 plus participants today? 
um, uh, before we end the session, uh, a quick one, maybe uh, the, uh, ladies first, uh, Prof, you want to go first? Thank you for uh, yeah, joining us this morning. Yeah, And then I'm happy to share everything with uh, all of you guys. But then I think um, we do not know the nature of this organism yet. Yeah, uh, Still, we do not know how long the, the pandemic will continue. So stay safe, stay um, comply to the, all the uh, guidelines to the, uh, uh, and um, stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Dr. Arifin? Um, I guess I, I should end. Uh, don't get COVID. That's number one. <laughs> uh, because you don't want to go through what I went through. And uh, I think uh, keeping to the <laughs> protocols and the procedures are very important. Uh, not only for yourself, for your family and also for your patients. Mm. So uh, I was lucky that I wasn't uh, the one that spread it to anybody, even though what the, the, the cluster diagram said, uh, because mm -hmm. it was it was put in a time of uh, what they call diagnosis made. But uh, the point here is that, I mean, as healthcare, healthcare providers, we should actually uh, spend more time with our patient, you know, put the human touch back in. And I think that is the, the most important message that I want to tell you now because we, we talk a lot about technology, but we always forgot that with technology, we can actually make it more human. So that's my last uh, point. Thank you, Joy. Thank you very much. I can't agree more. Uh, so we hope everyone today walk away from the session a little bit more enlightened, a little bit more encouraged, uh, and also a little bit more empowered by the knowledge that we gained today. Uh, and before we end the session, I am glad to inform all participants that uh, InnoQ together with RespoCare, in appreciation right, of your participation and in support of our frontliners, uh, we will be giving away a box of N95 antiviral masks to 30 selected hospitals who have registered with us today. So thank you very much for all of your participation and all your sacrifices. Now, our staff will be in touch with you to ensure that you receive the item. Now, um, uh, to all the participants, e-certificates will be sent to all of you. Uh, again, on behalf of the organizing team, uh, we thank the speakers for your time and effort in joining us and preparation for all this, Prof and Dr. Arfi. I know that you guys are really busy, but you have taken you know, the time out to do this together with us. And uh, last but not least, we humbly request all the participants today, please provide us your feedback at the end of the session so that um, you can help us to plan and organize this session better for you in the future. So until we all meet again, uh, stay safe, everyone. Uh, and I uh, hope you have a good weekend ahead. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.